Welcome, and thank you so much for joining our webinar tonight. I'm Tierra Curry. I'm a senior scientist in our Saving Life on Earth campaign here at the Center for Biological Diversity. I'm joining this webinar tonight from traditional Shawnee territory, and my pronouns are she, her. Thank you so much for joining us to learn more about the many ways that we are working to end extinction. We have a very special program tonight hosted by our Population and Sustainability Program about how population growth is pushing the limits of natural resources around the world. So first, we're going to have a conversation with our panelists, and then we're going to open it up to your questions. We'll post the video of the webinar tomorrow, and then later we'll add closed captions and Spanish translation. And if you want to follow along live on Twitter during the webinar, you can use hashtag 8 billion angels. Linda, a fellow staff member here at the center, is going to be live tweeting while, while we're having this conversation. So today's event coincides with a week of action to advocate for the passage of the Global HER Act. The Global Health, Rights, and Empowerment Act would permanently repeal the global gag rule. President Biden has rescinded the global gag rule during his presidency, but without permanently repealing the policy, future presidents could reinstate it. So you're going to learn more about this from our panelists. And I just want to say, please be mindful that population can be a sensitive issue for many people. So please be respectful of all people's views when asking questions. And I'm very excited for you to meet our panelists. We have Terry, the producer, Nandita from World Population Balance, and Sarah from the Center's Population and Sustainability Team. So I'm going to hand it over to them to tell you a little bit about themselves. Ladies first. For me. Go ahead, Terry. Uh, well. Uh, you know, thank you, Tara, and uh, everyone else on the panel. Um, and uh, appreciate all of you tuning in tonight. And uh, I, I hope you enjoyed the film. I look forward to hearing, uh, you know, all the questions and and uh, you know, uh, talking candidly. Um, yeah, just to sort of uh, give you my background. You know, in my lifetime, uh, you know, I've personally witnessed uh, remarkable changes in humanity, um, our growth and prosperity, and our lifespans, and in our sheer numbers across the globe. And I remember as a child, you know, in the 70s, uh, you know, I saw these, you know, unintended consequences of this immense growth. And uh, despite a, you know, a public awakening to our, you know, resource exploitation and our environmental pollution, you know, which gave rise to, you know, recycling, renewable energy, uh, land conservation, environmental awareness and stewardship, you know, we now see that, you know, no amount of, you know, ingenuity or uh, technology or, or voluntary reduction in our consumption or conservation has been able to halt uh, what I'd say are the greater forces propelling us toward, you know, uh, things like water scarcity and deforestation and, uh, you know, a host of other catastrophes like um, climate change and species extinction. And, uh, you know, all of our efforts uh, up until now have, you know, essentially amounted to stopgap measures uh, that, you know, really distract us from uh, the fact that, you know, we're adding 80 million more people, you know, every year to the earth, you know, it's the, uh, it's the equivalent of about four New York City metro regions, um, you know, and who together with everyone else on the planet consume more resources faster than the world can replenish them and, and we generate more waste than, you know, the earth can naturally absorb. So, you know, five years ago, I guess, uh, you know, I decided to, you know, stop watching uh, the world uh, my children now live in become unlivable and uh, do something about it. And uh, I quit my job and I, I dedicated my time and a significant amount of my savings to, you know, telling this truth, you know, through the film that you all watched to, you know, about the problem of unsustainable population growth that, you know, many in, in the film world and uh, in environmental circles and, in, you know, in the general public fear discussing because, you uh, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a sensitive topic, and uh, it's but in, in our hearts we know it's very real. So uh, I hope you know through the film we we tried uh, confronting it openly, honestly, and sensitively. You know, through the stories of everyday people, uh, I wanted to share uh, hope and real solutions, and uh, you know, offer an alternative vision for the future of you know actual uh, better human health. Uh, you know, true what I'd say true economic prosperity and, and real social justice and. Uh, an authentic path toward restoring the natural world and achieving genuine sustainability. Thanks, Terry. Nandita, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, Tara. Um, thank you to Center, Bi Center for Biological Diversity for 
uh, organizing this incredible panel and for inviting me to join you. Um, I am currently a very new executive director at World Population Balance. Um, I am also currently completing my uh, grad degree in humane education with the focus on overpopulation and its intimate links to pronatalism, which I'll speak to a little bit more later. Um, I've been interested in the overpopulation issue for over a decade, and it's more recently over the last three or four years that I've really started to take a more active advocacy role. And I am um, thrilled to be participating in this um, conversation to help normal normalize the conversation about overpopulation and about um, the social justice issue that it um, brings to um, to our communities. Thank you. Over to you, Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah Bailey, uh, pronouns are she, her, and I am on Winhodron land in Western New York. And I'm the population and sustainability organizer at the Center for Biological Diversity. So uh, my job is managing our outreach efforts to help educate people about human population growth and the associated pressures. Um, so I manage things like our Endangered Species Condoms Project, which I will talk about later, and our Pillow Talk Outreach Program. Um, so that's me. And um, we thought we'd start today's out event with a little poll, and Griselda is going to put that up uh, right now. Um, so what part of the movie resonated most with you since it was broken up into four sections, oceans, land, rivers and air, and population? I'll give everyone some time to respond. You can only pick one. I guess we can close that whenever we get a decent amount of responses. I can't see how many people have responded on my end. All right, looks like it was fairly even across the board, but half of people um, really resonated with the population section. So that's interesting. And we'll obviously get into that a lot more. <laughs> um, so for those of you that didn't get to watch the documentary or need a memory jog, we wanna take a couple minutes to show you the trailer before we start the panel discussion. Um, Griselda, you can put that on now. One of the things my mother always taught me, when you borrow something, you always give it back in better shape than when you got it. We're not doing that. The earth tells us that it's in trouble in a bunch of different ways. Climate change. Mass starvation. Ecological disaster. We're seeing the effects all over this planet. The oceans are sick. The air is unbreathable. Farmland is turning to desert. We are in the process of killing ourselves. We are trashing the planet. Why are we doing that? Population growth, it's an overwhelming problem. The Earth is just plain ravaged by too many people consuming too many resources. The numbers will continue to grow. Eight billion isn't sustainable. It's been ramping up and ramping up. We need to turn things around. There is no excuse to bury our heads in the sand. Action is the antidote to despair. It's not hopeless. There are many things we can do. We know we can change societies. It's a matter of people making the commitment. We don't have the time to waste. We still have coral reefs. We've still got forests around the world. Now's the time to save them. If we continue like we are, they're gonna be lost. 
We need to figure out how to live in harmony with planet Earth. It's for not only my grandson, but it's for all of yours. The hope is that people will realize we're all in it together. Every morning when I get up, I have hope. Terry, your film is just so beautiful. It's not only educational, it's just visually stunning. Um, I want to start the conversation with you. Do you want to tell us more about your impetus for making the movie and about Earth Overshoot? Um, you know, as I, I said in the introduction, I, I had, I'm 55 years old and I've just seen the, the changes happen over my lifetime and they're dramatic. Uh, they, they sort of happen in slow motion, but when you look at them from a, a perspective of human history uh, of 200,000 years or even geologic, they're instantaneous. And, uh, you know, they, they require us to, to really, uh, you know, look at it, you know, closely and have and, and, and act on it. And so, uh, as I said, I, I, I stopped everything and left my job and, uh, you know, dedicated my, my last five years to this film and, and to what you just said, I established a nonprofit, Earth Overshoot, to help educate people more on the issues of, you know, sustainability and, and uh, what it truly means, uh, because I think uh, it's uh, not often looked at and, and examined closely, and, and we definitely need to do a better job of that. And I think if you go to earthovershoot.org, you can really learn a lot about, you know, what is real sustainability. And we're going to put some links from Earth Overshoot into the chat so that you all can access the website. Thanks, Terry. Um, Nandita, let's go over to you. Working to decrease population pressure can be a really sensitive subject. So how do you work on this topic while keeping justice at the forefront? Thank you, Tara. Um, yes, um, the reason population or overpopulation is such a sensitive subject is because there has been a fraught history of um, population control through coercive and exploitative methods um, that have um, really infringed upon people's human rights, reproductive rights, in order to use it as a means to control people's fertility. And so there's no big surprise that there is a lot of uh, stigma around the topic of overpopulation because people automatically equate that to terrible policies. Um, you know, in terms of personal reference, only a few years before I was born in India, um, there was a mass sterilization campaign there that affected uh, millions of men and women who were coerced into forced sterilization, um, again, with the goal of population control. And these are practices that have been, there are several countries that have enacted practices like that, but there continue to be practices that are currently being exercised in a lot of communities and countries that continue, that for, you know, from our perspective need to be acknowledged and condemned um, continuously um, to, to make sure that people's social justice and human rights are always upheld when we're speaking about overpopulation. But at the same time, you know, it's important to not understate the impacts of overpopulation. I say that overpopulation itself is a social justice issue. Um, it's impacting um, ton, tons of communities. The, the growing human expansionism is, you know, a leading cause of resource scarcity, poverty, um, pollution, incredible pollution, as you even saw in the film, um, both ground, um, air and water pollution in India, for example, that are um, impacting the most marginalized and impoverished communities. So, you know, people in the wealthier communities who um, have such high consumption levels can often by their way out of a lot of these impacts that, that we experience and we cause. But it's really important for us to keep in mind um, the global impacts of overpopulation, not just in developing countries, but the impact of you know, fertility within wealthier countries and the disproportionate uh, footprint that a child that's born in a country like Canada or US has 
um, globally. And I just want to also emphasize that um, there have been incredible examples of human rights based um, population policies and initiatives that have lifted people out of dire situations um, by um, enacting policies that, you know, over a matter of a decade or two decades have um, reduced fertility rate from over six to, to under two through strategies that include empowerment, education, and upholding of human rights, such as Thailand, um, Bangladesh, um, Costa Rica, Iran, etc. So I think it's, it's really important to decouple the, um, the issue of overpopulation from the bad history, um, but not understate how bad it is. Uh, and I'll always keep the human rights framework at the center of anything we do with regards to population. Absolutely, I, I love that the way that you framed that. Um, Sarah, let's kick it over to you and talk about wildlife impacts here in North America. Can you tell us some North American species that are being impacted by population pressure? Sure. Um, the most easy to reference for me are the ones on the endangered species condoms because they feature species that are particularly impacted by human population growth. Um, so for those who are not familiar, these are the endangered species condoms. So they've got fun phrases like before your clothes hit the floor, think of the California condor. And then inside you get some condoms and more information. And this is to remind people that um, just like Nandita was saying, human rights-based solutions like voluntary family planning, like having safe sex and using contraception is a great way to help wildlife. So with that, um, some of the other species that are featured on the condoms are species like monarch butterflies, where uh, most of these species are facing a lot of habitat destruction and loss due to um, growing po uh, human population and um, us needing food, land, and clean water to survive. So monarch butterflies are facing habitat loss um, along their 2,000 mile migration route, um, being lost to agriculture, uh, for feeding people and for feeding livestock. Um, what else? Sea otters are facing offshore drilling and also are sometimes caught as bycatch with fishing. And hellbenders, which are a fun, really large salamander in North America, um, are they are facing uh, water pollution from agricultural runoff and there's whooping cranes that run in, can run into our infrastructure like power lines along their flight path. Um, and while those are just a few like kind of putting faces uh, to the issue, this is a super widespread issue among all wildlife uh, globally. Um, as we continue to develop land and sprawl out um, into undeveloped areas, uh, we're impacting all kinds of ecosystems. So a recent study that I think came out last year shows that 85% of terrestrial vertebrate species um, have over half of their range exposed to intense human pressure. Um, and 16% of those species are entirely exposed, their range is entirely exposed to that amount of pressure. Um, so this is, yeah, this is not just about a handful of species, this is really widespread. As you were talking, I was thinking that it's kind of hard to think of wildlife species that aren't impacted by population pressures. Um, Terry, like population discussions a lot of times tend to focus on the global south, but what about the United States and the need for voluntary family planning and women's empowerment in this country? Um, well, Sarah, I just want to say I, I totally wholeheartedly agree with what you just said, and, and it's interesting that not uh, none of those uh, incidences were really around climate change, although climate change is very real. But you know the impact of uh, our growing numbers uh, has an equal and opposite impact on on all species, uh, increasing their vulnerability rates of extinction. So, yeah, uh, we we absolutely have to make uh, you know be you know make this a, a, a really important uh, uh, you know part of our our overall uh, you know improvement of the world and its environment. On you know I guess on the the uh, area of uh, fertility, as, as you, we all are pretty aware, the United States is at about, I think it's 1.74 uh, children per woman. So we're below replacement and, uh, and it's been declining for years. And, and a lot of the developed uh, world uh, is seeing those same sorts of uh, trends and, and that's all very good. But uh, unfortunately, it's not good enough because we're also the, one of the highest consuming per capita you know, uh, countries in the world. And we're pushing a lot of that, uh, you know, degradation to the environment for our goods and services to the to the developing world, to the you know the global south, and that's a 
as you saw in the film, it's, it's a real problem with pollution over there because we've exported it, and, uh, but we import all the goods. And the other problem is it makes us highly reliant on all these you know, minerals and metals and resources. And for every additional person we add to our country, uh, it does increase our, our risks and our vulnerability as, as, as a nation. Uh, so it's a, it's a national security issue, but it's also an, a deeply ecological uh, you know, uh, problem, both here and abroad from you know, our consumption. So, and that's not easy to change. You know, people that say, uh, well, I can reduce my consumption, but what they don't understand, and, and Nandita, Nandita uses the term decouple, you know, if I decide to, you know, uh, reduce my consumption, let's say by, you know, giving up driving, uh, I also see an economic benefit. I see, a, a, you know, about $6,000 in savings from that because that's what the average uh, consumer pays in car payments and operating the car for a year. And, you know, that 6000 just doesn't disappear. It gets shifted typically towards other types of consumption. So it's very hard to actually reduce our overall consumption. We might shift it around, but unknowingly. Uh, but it's a challenge. So uh, I think it's really important that we have this you know, conversation about our, our, our population. I was listening to Living on Earth from PRI today, and they had a really recent episode about how pollution is placed on people who aren't using the goods. Like the, they bear the pollution, ship it to the United States. We use it, ship the trash back, and they're paying the whole pollution cost of it. Um, th thank you for that. Nandita, let's go back over to you. In the movie, there's an interview with Zoe Weil from Antioch's Institute for Human, Humane, Human Education that you're associated with. Um, can you tell us more about the humane education approach to addressing population growth? Sure. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to the Institute for Humane Education and Zoe because uh, they just celebrated their 25th uh, anniversary just last night. Um, so that's the institute where I'm completing my graduate degree in humane education, like I said, in the area of overpopulation and pronatalism. And the humane education framework looks at issues from a lens that includes the interconnection between human rights, animal protection, and environmental restoration. And the idea behind this framework is leaving out any one of these issues makes the solution incomplete. And that an, an oppression that's taking place in one area is invariably linked to another oppression somewhere else. So, um, you know, in terms of, as an example of um, humane education work, one thing that often gets left out of um, the population discussion, uh, which I know you guys aren't doing because you um, are the Center for Biological Diversity, um, is, is the framework of human supremacy from which we approach, approach this issue. Um, we almost always um, ask the question uh, or frame the question in a way um, that's very person-centered or human-centered of how many people can we fit, feed, shelter on this planet with no or very little regard for the other species that happen to share the planet with us and have just as much of a right to exist and thrive in this world. Um, the best indication, I think, Sarah, you already mentioned, of a human supremacist worldview is that humans and our domesticated livestock, such as pigs and cows, they account for about 96% of the biomass of all the mammals. And wild animals are only accounting for about 4% you know, which is a complete flip from a few thousand years ago when we were just a tiny little small part of a rich global biodiverse ecosystem. And right now, um, again, I know Sarah, you briefly mentioned this, is agriculture and the killing of wild animals are the two main factors behind life's disruption. Half of the world's habitable land is used for agriculture a staggering 77% of that is used for animal agriculture. So animal agriculture is one of the largest, largest threats to biodiversity. And the number that you just mentioned is 86% of wildlife that are considered to be threatened to become extinct are a direct cause of the expansion in animal agriculture due to habitat loss. And you know, the question is why is agriculture expanding so quickly? It's because we are growing by a million every five days. That's 80 million people per year. And as the global middle class is expanding, so does our increase for 
uh, increase in meat consumption. A good example is over the last 50 years, since our human, overpopul human population has doubled in 1970 from 4 billion to 8 billion now, meat consumption has increased by five times. Aside from the fact that animal agriculture is one of the most inefficient food procurement practices in the world, um, in that it uses most of the world's agricultural land and only produces 18% of the world's calories, it is one of the most destructive practices. Um, you know, it causes unimaginable suffering to the 70 billion animals that we kill globally for food every year. And aside from that, it's also one of the leading cause of greenhouse gas emissions. So we can't really leave out this really important link between um, our growing numbers our increase in demand for animal agriculture, and then the linked oppression to what the greenhouse gas emissions from animal agriculture are leading to. So that's, that's kind of a humane education framework of looking at issues where it's impossible to separate one form of oppression from another. And you know, if you do that, you're kind of looking at a solution from an incomplete framework. Thanks, Nandita. Um, Sarah, well, Terry, Terry and Sarah, I love how your movie talked about ocean, lands, and air, and not, not just one topic, because those are all areas that the center works on, um, and they're all interconnected. So Sarah, can you tell us a little bit about more about the work that you're doing? Sure. Well, I guess I'm I'm not involved in all this. We have lots of programs at the center, many of which kind of tie into a lot of the sections of the film. Um, we have an oceans team uh, that works to safeguard species and habitat um, in marine, in marine uh, habitat. Uh, we have our Climate Law Institute uh, that is reducing, uh, working to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution. And I mean, we have public lands, we have our endangered species program. Um, Lots of, yeah, lots of amazing work happening to protect um, wildlife and the habitat they need to survive. And then in terms of um, the population sustainability program that I work with in, um, we are working to raise awareness about um, the effects that human population growth and pressure have on wildlife. Um, Nandita did a great job describing all the agricultural. We also, we have a food campaigner who works on all, um, many of those issues. Um, and then within the population work, uh, we also raise awareness about uh, policy that people can you know, either uh, not want to support or want to support, and which is the case now. Um, so if you want to help on the international front, uh, you can sign our action alert that's being shared in the chat. Um, and we hope you'll lend your support to uh, the Global Health Empowerment and Rights Act, which will per permanently repeal the global gag rule. Um, when in effect, this rule cuts off funding to international non-governmental organizations that provide abortion counseling or referrals, um, and that link will be in the chat. Um, we've also created some infographics uh, to help explain the laws and show who the impact and how they can be overturned, because there's a lot of stuff going on right now at various levels, whether that be state, national, or international. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Terry, so we've done a lot of film screenings for these webinars, and people are always curious about what happened after the movie and what's going on now. So I was wondering, um, do you know if the Midwest farmers are getting along yet or if the, you know, if the Ganges River pollution is improved or like catch us up to real time? Um, I, I highly doubt that the pollution is getting any better um, over in India, unfortunately, it just uh, as their numbers increase and uh, and they're, 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 it's, it's difficult. It requires, a, a, as, as, you, as you saw in the film, the politician said it's a, it's a, it's a massive, intractable, intractable problem that has so many different permutations, whether it's the you know, person burning some you know, uh, wood for your charcoal for you know, uh, making a meal to you know, the slashing and burning that goes on in all the fields. So I, I don't think that's changed. And as far as the farmers, I mean, uh, you know, the, the culture of grow, grow, grow is pretty much endemic out there at all expenses and all costs. Uh, you know, I think the way that people will change is uh, what we do in our own, you know, household. You know, if, if we, 
you know, really uh, push towards organic and it, it costs us more money, but there's a reason for that because it's organic. You just don't get the same yields that you would get with all the pesticides, herbicides and artificial, you know, inputs that go into our agricultural system of, you know, uh, you know, to depleting the aquifers and uh, all the you know, uh, you know, artificial fertilizers. So, um, uh, you know, there there are things that we need to do at home that uh, you know will trickle its way up to you know the, the you know the, the farm world, the agricultural system that we have, and and to our politicians. So it, it starts at home, I think. Thank you, and Nandita, I want to circle back to something you said in your introduction. You were talking about pronatalism. I just wanted to kind of ask you explicitly how how your work, how do you view pronatalism culture in relationship to population growth? Yeah, thank you, Tara. Um, as I said, I'm completing my graduate degree with that focus, and I've actually created a graduate level course that I'll be teaching at Antioch University in January um, called Pronatalism and Overpopulation, the Personal, Global, um, the Personal, Cultural, and Global Impacts of Having a Child. And the premise of pronatalism is that um, pronatalism is a social bias towards having children. And it is um, a highly invisible, deeply pervasive set of pressures um, that um, assume that uh, reproduction is natural and normal and that everybody should want children and that having children should be the central focus of every person's adult life. And depending on where in the world you live, um, your cultural norms very heavily dictate um, how pronatalism looks in your country. Um, so uh, one of the aspects that I'm looking at is just at such a young age, we are um, mediated to uh, think about our desires, our regrets, what makes us happy, what you know we should want, uh, what we should not want, how we should act. And even though we think that emotions and these deep desires are highly personal, um, they're for the most part heavily socially constructed. And um, one of the arguments with pronatalism is that the idea that everybody should want to have children is a highly socially constructed worldview that um, pressures people who may not be ready, who may not want to take that path um, into that um, act. Um, if you even compare the different countries where you look at the cultural norms, uh, where, you know, you survey people and women might say, or people might say that I desire eight children, you look at the culture within which they exist, and that's what the norm is within that culture. So really, um, a big part of pronatalism is that it's, it emanates from these religious, patriarchal, uh, economic driven uh, politics-driven pressures that make us believe that that is really the only normal choice for people to make. And um, the pressures are so pervasive that if you were to detract or move away from that choice, there are social devices that will uh, punish you. Um, in my own country, for example, for people who don't marry or don't have children or take a path that is you know, against the dominant narrative, you are socially ostracized. Um, so in that context, um, I argue that in order to really talk about overpopulation, we have to start addressing these social pressures that are making it very difficult for people to make autonomous, authentic decisions about childbearing. Um, and whether this is the right decision for them, whether it's the right decision for their children, for their family, for their community. And um, really the, the, the argument uh, often when, when we start talking about trying to challenge pronatalism, um, a very obvious argument is that we are antinatalist or that challenging pronatalism is anti-child, but it's quite the opposite. Um, the, the, the opposite of pronatalism is anti-pronatalism, 
really all we're trying to do is to challenge these pervasive forces so that people can have true liberated autonomy to decide what they want to do with their lives, whether that includes marriage, whether that includes kids, whether that includes adoption, whether that includes, you know, child-free, childless, and so many different types of families um, that, that are evolving. And so, um, you know, my guess is, and Sarah, you brought up this thing about the gag rule, for example, is there are millions of women around the world, over 200 million women, who don't have access to basic reproductive care. And that to me is one of the uh, symptoms of pronatalism, where countries or communi communities, including ours, that actively block um, contraceptives and family planning methods um, from people in order to keep growing their population, their taxpayer base, their consumer base. So, you know, that is why when we're talking about addressing overpopulation from kind of a social justice issue, it's important not to look at it as a, like a one size fits all solution of, you know, just saying that people need to have fewer kids. It's really important to understand the cultural religious, patriarchal, societal implications of people who choose to, to do, you know, something different and are punished for it and how difficult it is for people to really have true choice. Yes, to everything you just said. <laughs> um, so Sarah, how do you, in your work, how do you help people understand the human rights solutions that that we're advocating for, but also how do you empower people to talk about them? Sure. I mean, I always think it's uh, really worthwhile to take a beat to understand why people have any hesitation to talk about it. And Nandita did an excellent job mentioning um, a lot of the human rights injustices that have happened um, in the name of population control. The film itself um, discusses China's one child policy, one of the um, probably better known ones. Um, but I think it's also worth within that mentioning what has happened in the US um, domestically in terms of forced sterilizations of incarcerated, indiv incarcerated individuals, um, women in ICE detention centers. Um, and even if you're following the news today, Britney Spears conservatorship is another example of reproductive coercion. Um, that's you know the dangers of when other people get to decide who is fit and unfit to have children. Um, so those are concerns people um, are coming to these conversations with and they are, they are valid. Um, so addressing that and then taking that um, to emphasize how the solutions we advocate for at the center are voluntary family planning and just better access to quality healthcare to access those resources so people can decide if and when they um, want to have children um, and things as simple as comprehensive sex ed, which is not widespread across our country. It's a real patchwork um, state by state and school district by school district. Um, so in regards to that, and you know, those are big system-wide things, um, you know, on the individual level, I'm gonna bring it back to the condoms and try to make it a little lighter um, as we try to approach it with humor. Um, so cute little animal illustrations and funny slogans um, get people laughing and it makes, you know, a more taboo conversation a little more approachable to have. Um, and within that, um, we've also partnered with zoos and museums at their events. Um, to you know, reach audiences that like wildlife and help them understand this connection. Um, and we have a nationwide network of volunteers that give these out in their communities. Um, we've given away um, over a million condoms now since the project started 12 years ago. Um, and they give them out on their college campuses, their farmer's markets, to their youth groups. Um, and they're really helping start the conversation amongst their friends and family and in their communities. Um, and I think this helped because we, we know this, like in addition to everything we've discussed with injustices, we know people are just uncomfortable with this topic. Um, according to a national survey that we conducted in 2019, 34% um, of people prefer not to discuss population growth because they feel it's too complicated for a host of issues that we've already discussed. Um, the political climate can make it challenging um, or they just feel their peers would not appreciate discussing it. Because again, these are like, per family planning is personal. Um, and overall, it, it's also helping people understand how um, the importance of not oversimplifying it, right? We know it's population and consumption. Um, 
and we don't want to perpetuate systems of oppression that threaten both human rights and the environment. I realize I've gotten this far without saying that our focus at the center is particularly on domestic population growth and domestic policies for that because we have this outsized consumption um, that Travis Ryder spoke about in the film. Um, the U.S. makes up about 15% of the global population, or sorry, 5% of the global population, but 15% of the emissions. So we have each individual here has, a, has an outsized impact. So we really feel um, making sure there's also a focus on um, the rights-based solutions here in the United States um, is important as well. So hopefully that covered everything in your question too. Thanks, Sarah. And I wanna take questions from the audience now. Um, just a reminder that talking about population growth can be a sensitive topic for a number of reasons. So in order to break the taboo around it, it's important to approach it with empathy. So just a reminder to be respectful when, when posing your questions. So there's already a bunch of questions pouring in. Um, Terry, first one's for you. Who are the angels you reference in the title? Why'd you pick 8 billion angels? needed to demute myself. Um, you know, I think the, the sort of the inspiration of the, for the, you know, for the title of the film is, is really twofold. Um, you know, we as humans have an enormous uh, capacity for care and, and compassion and, and decency and love, you know, what I would, you know, term the better angels of our nature. Um, you know, yet as our, our numbers, as we all know, are, are quickly approaching 8 billion, uh, you know, our, our collective actions, no matter you know, how good or benign, uh, they're having, you know, massive and, and largely unintentional catastrophic consequences for us and every living creature. And, you know, we must, you know, find the moral courage to, you know, address uh, this truth. Right on. Um, so a couple of people have asked about overconsumption and said that it seems like the film kind of highlights that the real problem isn't just population, it's overconsumption by the minority of the world's population. And you guys have all touched on this a little bit, but how do we, how do we address that? I'll just say briefly, it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a very, very difficult challenge. And there are really three large obstacles here to reducing our consumption. One is the size or the magnitude of the problem. You know uh, the you know the 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 economic activity across our globe. Uh, every uh, you know uh, scientist I've spoken with, environmental scientist, uh, ecologist, uh, econ you know economics professors, they've all concurred that we need to reduce our overall consumption or economic activity by about half. And uh, that's that's just that's enormous. If you if you look at COVID last year alone. You know, that, that uh, had about a 5% contraction in, in our global economic activity, 5%. It was, it was nowhere near half. And it was enormously painful for, you know, let's set aside, the, you know, the health and, and, the, and the mortality issues, just the, the, the economic catastrophe that happened to families and to businesses and to, to countries. So, you know, it's, and, and then we, we need to reduce our consumption voluntarily. And that's the other challenge is not only do we have to reduce it by about half to get to sustainability, but you know, to re, you know, the, the challenge is, you know, how, how do we get the three and a half billion people who are living essentially above that sustainable threshold, which is, you know, very, very minimal. If you, if you go to our website, you can take a look at what, what a sustainable lifestyle looks like for eight billion people. But it's, it's like living in a very small apartment with very minimal plumbing and no central air, no central heat, no central hot water. It's never driving in a car. It's never flying in an airplane. It's eating only a plant-based local diet. I mean, there are all kinds of very limited, you know, uh, you know, uh, lifestyle choices that that may, that are sustainable. So, the three and a half billion people across the planet who are living, and all of us on the on, on the call tonight, are living above that level. And you know, how do we get these people who live in different countries, from different cultures and different beliefs, to you know, simultaneously and voluntarily reduce their consumption by as much as fifty to ninety percent? I mean, it's 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 practically impossible. And, and I mentioned the third issue, which is even if we do really, you know, contract that uh, consumption individually, you know, uh, what are we doing with those funds? Because uh, if we take those savings that we have from reducing our consumption, are we shifting it to other things that we don't realize? Are we leaving our heat up a little warmer in the wintertime? Are we, you know, buying a few more electronics? Are we buying more clothes? Are we traveling to abroad because we have this money that we no longer have from driving a car. So it's that what we really have to do is take those savings and you literally have to either destroy that wealth uh, or you have to basically conserve it in land. You know, you have to basically sequester that money and get it out of our economic system. So reducing consumption is an enormous task and it's a very difficult task. And, 
Uh, that's why when you look at that equation of our impact equals the number of us times our affluence, affluence is our wealth, it's our income and our assets. We really have to do both, but it's difficult. And I think it's actually, as, as Travis Reeder said in the film, you know, uh, reducing our numbers is actually probably more malleable. It's actually easier to do. And uh, yeah, people have done it before and then will continue to do it. Many countries have done it with very uh, intentional campaigns, all humane and all uh, non-coercively and all in voluntary ways. So it's a uh, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, an important thing to, you know, look at both, but it's, it's an it's enormous task. Sarah, Nandita, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, um, great coverage, Terry. I appreciate that. And I really appreciate the question because it is, again, a social justice based question is we in industrialized nations are consuming disproportionately um, you know, at high, disproportionately higher levels than uh, most of the world. So really the impetus is on us to take responsibility for a lot of the damage that we cause. And I think Terry mentioned earlier is, you know, we um, don't face those impacts right away because we outsource a lot of the nastiness um, of our habits onto other countries. But then, you know, in terms of reducing consumption, I would argue that there's actually a need for a large population in the world to increase their consumption to get to a level that's, a, you know, affords them the right to have a good life, um, just like we do. Um, so we need to lift people out of, out of substandard living conditions and, and give them, or not give them, but allow them the same level of um, rights that that we do. Um, so, you know, in large part, it does come down to, uh, I would say it starts with individual choices. And, um, you know, like Terry mentioned, giving up flying, giving up a car, giving up meat, uh, those are good places to start. But by far, uh, one of the biggest things you can do in an industrialized country um, consumption, which is very much related to um, population, is to have uh, fewer children. Uh, a child born in an industrialized country has a footprint of 20 to 50 times more than a child born in a developing country. So um, to me, really, the overshoot, the ecological overshoot is, is not separate from consumption and population. And Again, like Travis Reader was saying, it's a lot easier for us in terms of the richer countries to take responsibility. The easier thing really is to lower our fertility than it is to pull back on consumption. But I would argue, even if it's difficult, it's a moral obligation for us to, to do that now that we know better. Uh, even if it feels like a sacrifice, um, we must do that. Um, for planetary justice, for the millions of animals that are being displaced because of our lifestyles. Um, so really it is about planetary justice, intergenerational justice um, as well. And compassion and restraint. Like people in the United States and other really wealthy countries are gonna have to get a heart of compassion and then demonstrate some restraint in terms of consumption just last week, the, um, the UN put out the Intergovernmental Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, and the Intergovernmental Platform on Climate Change put out their first joint report. And it said that we can't address these things in silos. We have to simultaneously address poverty, climate change, and the biodiversity crisis. And the, I, I encourage you to check that out. It was it was really inspiring to me that finally someone was like, everybody has to have a decent standard of living and we have to save biodiversity and we have to fight climate change all at the same time because we, we can't be siloed issues anymore. Um, so there's tons of questions. We only have like nine minutes left. There's been a lot of questions about religion's role in this. Um, do you think the biggest problem with population growth is because religious groups want their religion to have the highest number of members or how can we work with them to improve access to birth control? This is like a, a touchy topic. I don't know. Nandi, do you want to take the first stab at it? Sure. Um, I think, I do think religion has a um, significant role to play. Um, but I, I think economy has just as much of a role to play in terms of, you know, how our capitalism 
Um, you know, growth-based economy is based on having more numbers to keep um, growing, you know, our population to keep, keep growing our economy. Um, and I do think, you know, pronatalism is um, really a symptom of this religious pressure. Um, so I, I think, you know, sometimes religion gets sidelined and we, we say it's kind of the main thing that's pressuring people into having kids. But you look at a lot of different countries that aren't relig religiously based uh, necessarily, and you will notice that there are other cultural forces that are still perpetuating this idea that um, having children is necessary. Um, I do think that yeah, religion and military driven um, population growth are, are probably at the height of these uh, social pressures. Um, but I'll, I'll let Sarah or Terry take on any further comments. Sarah, do you want to say something? Or... You're muted, Sarah. Thank you, sorry. Um, among religious groups, there are there are groups within them who do advocate for some of these solutions. Um, one that's top of mind or comes to mind for me is there is a group called Catholics for Choice that support family planning um, and abortion rights for women. Um, so I think there are definitely like um, it's important to recognize religion's role in terms of um, how you approach audiences in terms of being um, culturally sensitive um, and realizing sort of how that impacts what their access will be. Um, but there's so many areas to work on in regards to that. I think it's just about being sensitive to your audience. And, and I, I think with religion too, it's, uh, you know, uh, religions will also move with, uh, you know, the, the, the times and if, if the, their followers, uh, you know, find uh, an issue is important to them, uh, you know, the religion will work its way around there to some degree. And, uh, it also, I see, for example, right now, if you uh, study Egypt, uh, you know, they've got massive overpopulation problems. And uh, the, the uh, I'd say I call him a dictator there right now, is uh, El-Sisi is doing everything he can humanely to address it. And he's, you know, he's uh, enlisted all kinds of support from the, the priests there to reach out to their, their, their flocks to say, you know, uh, we need to, you know, find a the, the right, um, you know, verses in, in, in the Quran and everywhere else to address this issue. And, uh, you know, there's a part of the Quran that says uh, that uh, Allah's blessings uh, are not to defile the earth. So, you know, being able to take those scriptures and to be able to, uh, you know, find the passages and find the, 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 the you know, parables in there that can help people uh, and, and their, uh, you know, their constituencies be able to address this issue. Thank you all. Um, there's been a couple of questions about immigration. Would any of you like to comment on immigration's role in, in population? Sarah, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, that's one that comes up a lot for our work, especially with the domestic focus as uh, immigrate, the U.S. is growing more from immigration than from birth rates. Um, but we don't see um, limiting immigration as a solution to addressing population growth in the U.S. Um, we believe the right to immigrate is a human right. Um, and people should have the opportunity to better their life circumstances. Um, even though, you know, there's a lot of room for how to like, what is the ideal immigration policy? Um, but yeah, I mean, climate refugees are a real thing um, being caused by, you know, the climate change that's happening that a lot of US consumption is driving. So I think that's, uh, it's worth considering how hard it is to immigrate and leave your country. And it's not like a, a light topic, so. Tara, the only thing I would add to that is, um, is when um, governments and again, economy driven politicians use both babies and immigrants as pawns to increase their population. Uh, that's when I actually see it as an exploitation of human rights, um, where people are simply seen as increasing their taxpayer base, bringing in more money, uh, bringing in more investment, so the emphasis really isn't on increasing the welfare of the people that are coming in, 
because um, for the most part, you know, increasing population pressures does um, increase the pressures on the most marginalized communities within those countries, uh, including current immigrants. Um, so, uh, you know, as long as the policies are based on human rights frameworks, um, I think it is important to challenge um, dogma that is economy driven. The same kind of thing we see with baby bust alarmism that sees babies as a means to increase population rather than our governments and politicians putting money into um, healthy uh, family care policies, um, health citizen policies, um, employment policies that seek to reduce unemployment rather than constantly being driven by increasing the GDP growth. Um, I, you know, I, I, it's a very, very difficult subject. And it, it's unfortunate that, you know, we've come to a point in history where, you know, our country has far exceeded its carrying capacity. And, you know, every additional person, whether by birth or immigration, will you know, further, you know, imperil our fragile natural world and increase our vulnerability as a nation. And, you know, we have to grapple with this dilemma and we have to do it with, you know, grace and with, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the most uh, deepest morals uh, because these people who are coming here are suffering. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a shame that we've gotten to where we are, but it, it, it again, it accentuates our need to, you know, address uh, the issues that were outlined in the film. So we have a ton of questions. There's no way we're going to get to all of them. Um, do any of you want to comment really quickly about plastic? It's a couple of questions about it. Did you say plastic? Yeah, plastic. Sarah? Um, I know we are. Um, Support supporting sponsoring. I'm not entirely sure of the policy lingo. Uh, the Break Free from Plastic Act. Um, that's sort of an upstream solution uh, to plastic productions um, and helping with proper disposal of plastics. I believe um, I wasn't expecting a plastics question in a population webinar. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, switching away from plastics use where we don't actually need to have plastics and single use items is huge. Um, having proper disposal of these items is key. Um, with, you know, we have a recycling crisis and recycling, we can't recycle our way out of it. Um, and, you know, not having any more plastic cracker plants built because we, we do not need more of these goods. It's sort of a manufactured demand. So hopefully yeah. that there's a lot, there's a ton I could go into or that I, well, other people could go into, but. <laughs> Plastic comes from fossil fuel, and then we offload that pollution to other countries and the recycling toxins to other countries too. So we're out of time. I'm sorry that we don't have time to get to all of your questions, but feel free to email any of us to follow up. This has been a great discussion. Um, we appreciate you joining us. Thank you to our panelists and to Griselda and our awesome digital team for making this happen. If you didn't get a chance to watch the film before the webinar, Terry is graciously giving you another day. So you have until tomorrow to watch it. Terry, thank you so much for that. The video of this webinar will post tomorrow so you can share it with people. Go to biologicaldiversity.org and click on events and action events. And there's a link there to all of our past webinars. If you wanna take action to support the Global HER Act, we're gonna put the link in the chat. Um, please send comments on that. When we close this webinar, a survey is gonna pop up on your screen. If you take a minute to complete it, we would really appreciate hearing your thoughts. And we're gonna give away a coffee table book called Overdevelopment, Overpopulation, Overshoot. So you'll be entered to win that if you do the, um, the survey. Our next webinar is July 8th. It's an organizing webinar. We're gonna talk about how to save gray wolves. So as always, we're super grateful for your support. We couldn't do this work without you. And thank you for your time this evening. Take care. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Terry. Bye, Thanks, all. Thanks, Anita. Thanks, Sarah.